Uh, my name is Ray Elentini. I'm happy to have the honor to read the word this morning. Please stand with me as we read Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all long, where all, all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with joys, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mitzar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept me, swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony. My foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, and my God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ray. All right, you guys can have a seat. Um, man, I love that psalm, and I, and I asked uh, Ray to read that one this morning because, well, listen, we, we came in here singing about the joy we have to, to be in Jesus, to know Jesus, to be in the house of the Lord and rejoicing. Um, and then we, we read a psalm like this that's just about tears and mourning, and struggling. Why are you downcast, my soul? Right, you ever have a day like that where it's both? You know what I mean? Like the joy of the Lord is in you and you know him and you love him and you're so grateful for him and what he's done and his bloodshed for us. And at the same time, man, your soul just feels downcast and feels heavy. And um, like the Apostle Paul writes in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, we are people who are sorrowful yet always rejoicing, right? Like that's, that's the Christian life sometimes. And um, it's such a great thing. It's such good news that we have the gospel of Jesus, right? And even though our souls are often downcast, we still rejoice, and we're so glad in him. Um, so today, we're going to kind of um, have part two of a conversation that was begun last week, uh, just around mental health and, and some of these issues like the psalmists, like David, um, bring up from time to time about just, man, the, the, the human experience that we go through of highs and lows and everything in between, because that's just, that's the reality of life, right? Um, I believe that God has just laid it on my heart as your pastor, just to have this conversation for a couple of weeks. And we started last week. We're going to have a conversation here again today. And so um, in just a second, I'm going to bring Amy Kephart and Scott Moore up here. Amy is, you may or may not know Amy. Some of y'all may know Amy. Um, she is a mental health and rehab counselor serving Newton and Rockdale and Henry counties. After 25 years of working with teens and young adults as a teacher, um, Amy's just passionate about biblical, biblically educating on mental health and spirituality, seeing Jesus heal people from past wounds and traumas. Anybody amen to that? Like Jesus can heal us. Um, and helping people find peace from mental health symptoms such as hopelessness, anxiety, and depression. And then Scott Moore probably needs no uh, introduction, to it, but maybe some of you don't know who he is. Scott, you've been here since 1990, 1940. <laughs> what year did you come for real? 90, 91? 90, 1990. Um, and he was a lead pastor here for 14 years, I believe, right? 2008 to 22. Currently, our CR pastor, and, and Scott's just passionate about mental health and helping people find hope and healing in Jesus. So Amy and Scott, if y'all come on up here with us, um, y'all give them a hand. Just say thank you for being here with us. You guys have a seat. I know the light is red on that mic, but I think the, the batteries are working, so we should be good if it goes out. We good? We'll change mics on it. Um, well, thank y'all again. Thank y'all so much for being thank here. Um, 
What, what we're going to do today, guys, is just, like I said, we're going to have a half hour here just to, to talk, chat about, man, what the Lord is doing um, in the world of mental health. And just, uh, you guys, I, I, we talked about this the other day. I know probably neither one of y'all would say you're an expert on probably anything, I, myself included. But uh, man, I, I think at least you guys have some experience, some understanding, some education as well um, around these things that I don't have that I'm just so grateful. I'm, gra- I'm grateful that both of you guys can be sort of part of this conversation. So Amy, let's start with you just tell us a little bit about just how you got into the field of counseling and the mental health world and all that. Yeah, sure. So mainly it became a part of my life because I was dealing with my own mental health. Um, my father was a alcoholic since the time I was 12. And so I was raised by an alcoholic. I'm the oldest of five. And so my mom became quickly overwhelmed and realized we got to get into therapy. And so I was pretty much raised in therapy. So it became a natural part of what I did and how we did life. And then I became a teacher so I don't know if we have any teachers <laughs> well, the out teachers here. The teachers are like, we yeah. get it, we get it. Yeah. yeah, and with teaching comes counseling. And um, it was day after day. They were scheduling at lunches and after school. And then also worked with youth groups a lot, college age groups a lot. And you yeah. just begin to disciple. And as you disciple, with discipleship comes counseling. Yeah, and I know you have a particular passion for young people, for teens, and that's that's really awesome. Scott, I, I, I know your story a lot. I know a lot of us know your story, but just tell us a little bit about that. How did you become so passionate about this mental health thing? Um, well, like you said, most of you, a lot of you know my story, but if you don't, I was a senior pastor here and struggling with mental health issues like depression, mainly depression, and then it turned into suicidal thoughts, but I didn't feel like I could tell anybody. And all of a sudden, so I'm wearing this, I'm wearing this. And if I look back after having done a step study at Sober Recovery, I can trace it really all the way back to to high school and maybe even before then. But I felt like I couldn't tell anybody. And finally, it got to where the hopelessness really turned into a numbness. Mm -hmm. And I went to uh, Sammy, chairman of the elders at the time. And I went to Sammy. I said, hey, you need to know that your senior pastor doesn't want to do this anymore. And actually what I was, I didn't tell him I didn't want to live anymore. And, um, and so Sammy hooked me uh, up with, with a counselor. And, uh, man, I'm so thankful to Jesus for, for what he's done. So I also know statistically uh, half of us uh, in this room and half of all people will probably most likely be diagnosable with a mental health issue. And also I know right now 20% of us in this room um, are dealing with something and you maybe just don't feel like you can talk to anybody. And I just, yeah. I'm, I'm sick of seeing um, the victory that mental health is having because I do believe in Jesus. I do believe he's with us. I do believe he heals. And I do believe in the ministry of other people. And so um, I think uh, we had a, a group session uh, not too long ago and I realized I'm angry at the victory that mental health has been having. And I do believe the church uh, has the solution. And then also too, we as a body can do a lot more. Yeah. Amen to that. So, well, Scott, you've been such a great voice here for many years of just the authenticity of being able to talk about these things. I'm grateful for that. Um, I feel like I'm just, uh, I'm not really starting this conversation. I'm, I'm getting to come into it and be part of it too. So I'm very grateful for that. I know we as a church, we're just grateful to be able to talk about these things right here at church. Um, we talk about them on Thursday nights, but Sunday mornings too, right? Like we should be, we should be able to talk about it. Um, well, Amy, you're with um, Eagles Landing Christian Counseling Center um, and they're, they're fantastic over there. Didn't Denise Colson, Dr. Colson, she's the kind of lead over there. She she has this book, Trauma, and it's just called Trauma, and it says 10 reasons why Christians need to be talking about it. Um, and you and I have talked some about this already, and just kind of the, the role that trauma plays. So look, we're going to dive in. Is that cool? We're going to dive into this, some of this conversation. Um, just talk to us about this a little bit. Just what role specifically does trauma play in the mental health struggles that many of us experience in our lives, and how do you kind of address that in counseling? Okay, yeah. Scott actually just gave a really good summary of that. He said, these are my symptoms, depression, anxiety. I don't know what to do anymore. I'm tired of this fight. Mm -hmm. But when he went through a 12-step study, he was able to realize, oh, I trace it all the way back to high school or even before high school. Um, Depending on your generation, most of us were taught to suck it up and keep moving, right? And we still continue that today. Well, that is a survivor mentality. That's a trauma mentality. And that's okay when you need to do that. Our brains were made to protect our vital organs, right? Fight, flight, or freeze is what we're trained to do. And so in its proper function, that's right. Our 
problem has become that we are continuing to live as trauma survivors or as survivors of something, and we're not in a traumatic situation anymore. Some of us might be. But that sucking it up and that stuffing it down, the repressing, it's not how God made us. He made us to process our emotions. He gave us emotions, yeah. and we were taught not to deal with them. And so it's catching up with us. Um, there's uh, the fastest growing statistic right now among um, men ages 50 to 70 is that of suicide. And that's because we've learned you can't do it anymore. Your bodies are not made to do that. And so then what do we do as a church if we know God has given us emotions and they need to be processed? And that's where the counseling part comes in. That's why talk therapy works, right? You can get these intrusive thoughts. You can get these cycling thoughts that you can't get out. But when you have to stop and make it into a coherent sentence, whether on paper or in front of somebody, then it actually, it's you hearing it and actually believing it, and that's how you deal with it. It's acknowledging that feeling from that event. It is processing it. It is understanding, I lost these things because of this event, and I didn't just lose these things, but it was contradicting to some of the beliefs that I had. I should have been safe. I should have been taken care of. I should have been able to expect this in a relationship, and I didn't. And then the affirmations of this is how I've grown from this experience. That's resolution. Yeah. We, this is how God has helped me. This is how I can help others now. Kaiser Permanente did a study about 25 years ago, and they did it on adverse childhood experiences because mental health was exploding. And what they found was there were definite links to symptoms we're trying to manage, right? The depression, the anxiety, the coping, the numbing, to those adverse childhood experiences. And so Dr. Colson has actually written a trauma model. It's the best thing I've seen in a long time. And it helps you work back through that and to be able to process that trauma. And we've seen great healing. And healing is possible because we as a church have the cure, don't we? Yeah. And that's Jesus. That's right. And so being able to process that with him is the key. Yeah, so dealing with getting to the root, right? Like getting to the root of things instead of just looking at symptoms only, right? So speaking of symptoms, Scott, uh, what would you say like are the most common symptoms you're seeing right now through CR, especially just being a CR pastor? I know you see this symptoms a lot. Right. And like, how are people, she, she mentioned the coping mechanisms, mechanisms that we have, the suppression, whatever. Well, I don't know. What, what are we seeing really commonly? Well, when we see newcomers uh, coming in on Thursday night, uh, I, and I, I don't have the, the stats in front of me, but sometimes it seems like almost half of them is some type of mental health issue. Anxiety is huge, especially yeah. among our teens. Anxiety is huge, even among our adults. And, and depression is huge as well. But when you talk about the symptoms, um, a lot of times they'll medicate. And that this is something, uh, I'm not the expert. I'm probably the least experienced. <laughs> we have a team that's unbelievable and I have the least amount of experience, but I watch <laughs> like crazy, okay? Uh, it, I'm so happy they let me be the CR yeah. pastor. Yeah. Um, but... Just by watching things, I see these men and these women, these students come in, but through observation, the number one thing they medicate with, the number three, the three things they medicate with is food, porn, and alcohol. Man. Okay. And then we'll see people come in with those issues. And listen, you know how brave that is? I mean, for people to show up, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's braver than what I could do. I finally just had to go to, you know, a friend, you know, but man, they show up and they're saying they want help. But what we're finding out, they're coming in with all these other issues and maybe they think the alcohol, the porn, the drugs, and only 20% of people, let me say this real quick, on CR, everybody thinks it's um, drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's really only 20 to 25%. Everything else is codependency, anger, yeah. uh, anxiety, depression, um, uh, sexual addiction, something like that. But we find out once they're there and they, they start getting into a step study, um, they realize the addiction is not really the problem. It's just masking a hurt trauma right. from a younger age. Or, or maybe they did. Maybe they, as a kid, they just got into it. You know, yeah. They're finding freedom. But I really see the symptoms being the anxiety and the depression and then masking it with the food, the yeah. porn, and the alcohol. Man, that's so real. Um, about trauma too. I was thinking about this, Amy, as you were talking about trauma, just talk to us a little bit about like, the, can trauma be self-inflicted or is it only others inflicted? I'm just, I, I think it's a, that's a question I'm wondering. Like, what does that look like? What, what do y'all see with that? So trauma is usually coming from an outside source, mm -hmm. right? And it's usually a person. It can be an event if you um, weathered a hurricane or a catastrophic event that's natural of some sort, but usually it comes from a source and it's from a person. 
And so that's a really good question to ask too, Kurt, because what happens is when we go through your original event um, and we don't deal with that trauma, we will become cyclical even in our coping and in our numbing. And so we will almost stay on a roundabout type situation. We can't find the exit. And we continue to cycle around and around trying different things. And what will eventually happen is we will begin to form tra trauma survivor responses to our own trauma survivor responses. And so it just keeps piling up mm. and piling up. It's a terrible cycle, yeah. So thinking about this holistic approach, I've loved having a conversation with both of y'all about this stuff, just the holistic approach to our wellness, our well-being. Jesus said, John 10, 10, that I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly, right? Now, that doesn't mean life's always easy or perfect or we're gonna be healthy and wealthy all the time. It just means Jesus is life and he's the healer. You just said that. And so we come to him with everything. Now that means body and soul. Yeah. Body, soul, mind, all of us. So let's talk about this for a second, just that holistic approach. And this is for both of y'all, however y'all want to answer. Um, what is, what, how do they both factor in? <laughs> so how do they both factor in? Body and spirit and mind, like how does all those things play a role in our, in our mental health? So, you know, our, our body's been purchased, right, mm -hmm. by Christ. So, so, and we're told to honor uh, Christ with our body. So a lot of times we think of uh, we come to church, we're just wanting to deal with our, our soul or our spirit or, you know. And man, no, we all belong to God. All of life is spiritual, okay? My body is spiritual, my soul, my mind, and all that is spiritual. And so what we're seeing, I, I, well, let me say this. I, I saw this interview, um, this gentleman was interviewing a, a psychiatrist, and he said, hey, I had this patient, and I'd been seeing him for like three years. He was bipolar, schizophrenic, he was on meds. And nothing was happening. We were keeping him safe, right? We are just keeping him safe. But there was no progress. And so one day he says, I walked in and the patient said, will you help me lose weight? And sure, I guess he's getting paid either way, you know. Yeah. So now he's a nutritionist. And so he puts him on a ketogenic diet. And I'm not up here promoting the ketogenic diet. But the ketogenic diet was created by neurologists back in 1921 to help patients with epilepsy. Hmm. All right, which takes place in the brain. So what they started doing, they took out the artificial flavors. They took out all the preservatives and he went to a, now a lot of you are getting mad at me because you, you, you know what I'm getting ready to say, right? Like, oh my I, get, I can tell you to quit looking at porn. You won't get mad at me. I tell you, watch what you're stop eating. Stop eating Skittles. Yeah, you stop no. eating. And look, I'm a peanut M&M fiend, all right? So there's that confession. But they started taking all that out. Now he couldn't come off his meds. So I don't want you to hear the story and think, I'm going to come off my meds. Don't do that. He couldn't come off his meds. He couldn't quit seeing the therapist. But within, this man that couldn't have a relationship, that couldn't have a job, that all of a sudden um, he got his black belt in karate. He's teaching karate. He has a job, and he's engaged, and he's off all his meds and no diagnoses because they changed his diet. Yeah. So now they're starting to see a correlation. There's a new field coming out called nutritional psychiatry. And they're, they're treating it. Now, again, they can't come off their meds. They can't quit seeing their therapist. But they're beginning to treat some of these mental health issues. That does not replace the trauma. Okay, that doesn't treat the trauma. But why would we as believers treat our body in such an unholy way? And it's just magnifying the mental health issues. Yeah. So let's work with the spirit and let's listen and let's be good stewards of our body. Now, some people are really mad at me. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we, we, that's, that's so good because last week we read Elijah's story, right? Mm -hmm. What was one of the things God did for him? Hey, sleep and eat, yep. buddy. You yeah. know, you're, you're struggling, you're, you know, all the things. It's not the answer to every problem, but it's a huge factor. 38% though, I will say this, um, of all the people that have done this. Now this, out of 100% of people dealing with mental health issues, 38%, there's one way. Teens right now are seeing anxiety like crazy. Yeah. I, I had a, a, a young man calling me about every two or three weeks crying. He loves Jesus, mm -hmm. loves Jesus, all right? He is a warrior for Jesus, and he's crying. And then one day I said, how much caffeine do you drink? Well, I drink three energy drinks a day, and I drink about seven cups of coffee. Man, here, you want to hear some wisdom? You know what I said? Stop it. <laughs> you know, drink two cups of coffee. You know what? Now he's got some trauma issues he's dealing with, but his anxiety went from up here to down here. And I'm going to just say this. If you got kids drinking any drinks, stop man, it. get them to stop it. Yeah. Yeah. 
You want to jump in on? Oh, of course, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know you're like, give me some. She's of like, that. he took all my yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> when you come to counseling, one of the first things that I'm going to do is assess you for your mind, body, soul, and spirit. Right. So, how much are you sleeping? What are you eating? What is your diet like? Have you been to see your primary care physician lately? Because as our bodies change and we get older, things can trigger other things. And because our systems are made so fantastically by God, right? Mind, body, soul, and spirit really do affect each other. And as one is depleted, the others have to ramp up to help it. And then they the whole system becomes depleted. And so that is a yeah. very important first step. Um, the other thing we're talking about are the brain's activity, right? And the neural pathways. When you're talking about coping mechanisms and numbing, you're talking about habits pretty much. And those are neural pathways that have been formed in your brain. And the cool thing is, is that we really can retrain our brains and we really can develop new neural pathways. It's not easy, but we can do it. There was a study done by a famous neuroscientist by the name of Tara Schwartz, and she reported that she got a group of bodybuilders and she had them um, do nothing but sit in a chair and think about the routine. They couldn't go into the gym for two weeks, and they would sit there for the same amount of time they'd be going into the gym, and they would go all through the routine, dressing, walking into the gym, going to the weights, putting them on, lifting them, putting them out. And this is with their eyes closed. They're doing this the whole hour. After two weeks, they saw a 13% body mass gain from that, and that was just from them <laughs> creating that neural pathway. I knew so I didn't have to work out to, to get big. I knew it. Praise God. That's what we're here for, guys. Selective hearing. That's amazing, though. That is amazing, right? And just, the, again, the, 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 the mental, the physical, the soul. So, I mean, gosh, we're sitting here talking about this. Let's, let's hear what Jesus has to say about it. Um, hey, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? This guy asked him. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. We can't do that if those things aren't healthy, right? right? And, and to us, and that's why we're having this conversation. So that again, we can just think about God created all of us. I love that you said that, Scott. He created your body and your soul and your mind and your heart. And so if we're neglecting any of the parts of us, then we are neglecting the, man, the life that God has called us into and, and abusing those parts of ourselves if we're not taking care of those things. And sometimes we only feel as good spiritually as we do physically. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we can memorize all the scripture and we can do all this. But sometimes I, I think what happens is, and then this is for the, the church, and is sometimes our, our knowledge of scripture far exceeds our application of scripture. You know, and so we'll, we'll confess the big sins, but being a bad steward of our, our, our body or, or our mind, we don't really, we don't confess those, you know. And we really... <laughs> yeah, hey. snap it up. We really can retrain our brains. God's given us the ability to do that, but he's also given us the pathway to do that. Romans 12, 1 and 2 gives us a very perfect example how to do that. Daily, we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, right? We're not conformed to this world, but we are transformed. And how do we do that? We renew our mind, and it is a daily mm -hmm. presenting my body as a living sacrifice so that I can daily renew my mind. Days turn into weeks, which turn into months, which turn into years until you can look back and a year later, you're not even the same person. Yeah. Oh, in months, you're not even the same person, right? Man. So let's talk about, um, man, just the kind of maybe even the, the first step for a lot of people is this acknowledgement that there's a God. And that God is the one who did create us and God created our minds, God created our bodies. Because I know for some people, that's, that's a hard first step. Even getting to this place where maybe if I'm struggling with my mental health or any part of my health, I, I, I don't start there. I don't start with the Lord. Um, so what does that, let's start with you, Amy. What does that look like in counseling when you're talking with somebody? Like, how are you engaging them on that level of just, hey, let's, let's get to the source of who, who it is that we're talking about is the healer here. Yeah, what's that look like? In so the first thing that I um, like to ask people is, where is God in your situation? Where do you see him? How do you see him? That tells me a lot about your relationship with him. Do you even have a relationship with him? Scott mentioned a minute ago, we know a lot about the Bible. We know a lot of stories. We know a lot of scripture. But James tells us that we can't just be hearers of the word. We have to be mm -hmm. doers. And that's the application of it. And so developing that relationship is the very first step to healing and then applying the word. I wanted to, if I could just for a second, do a little exercise with you guys of applying the word. Can you do that with me? 
Is that cool? All right. If you will, hold out your hands for me. Make a fist and then close your eyes. And I want you to think, what are some of the things that I go to first before I go to God? What are some of the things I put my faith in to help me, to numb me, to cope? They take my time. They take my energy. What is that? And if you are wanting to give that to God, and I want to be free of this, I want to be rid of that, I want you to tell him that right now. Talk to him just like you would a regular person. We're relating to God our Father here right now. In the name of Jesus, I just want to give these up to you. And I want you to open your eyes. And as you do, I want you to open your hand. And I want you to let him have it. I'll let him take it. That's applying scripture. That's allowing him to relate to us in a real and personal way. I know part of the, man, on, on Thursday nights when you're here, you're going to, like one of the steps we all talk about and we go through and we say every week is, man, we acknowledge that there's a higher power, so to speak. That's, a, that's an AA kind of thing, but man, for us, we know it's Jesus. Oh, yeah, we, we go ahead and just name it. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, we're, it's, we, we yeah, got Jesus, yeah. right? So, we got yeah, Jesus. The good thing, uh, they come to CR, they're coming inside a church building, so yeah. we know that Jesus Christ is not a higher power. He's the He's higher the, power. Yeah. He's supreme in authority. And so we get to start, you know, it's step three, but we get to start there. Yeah. You know, and so we're, we're going to mention, you, you cannot do any of this. Yeah. If you try to do recovery without Jesus, it's just works. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's painful. And, and then the, good, the bad thing about works is it's all dependent upon us. And yeah. look, I don't trust myself as far as I can throw myself. But I trust Jesus. That's right. You know, I trust Jesus. So. Man. So let's talk a little bit of a shift. But I mean, it's all in the same vein, guys. Just about community. An authentic community. Um, what a huge part of it. If, show of hands, who would attest to the fact, or just, we can use a church word, testify to the fact that <laughs> community has been huge in your life. Community has been huge in your life of just being well and being healed. And man, me too, because it is it's such a vital part of who we are as people. Um, so let's talk about that. Just what, what do you guys see as just why is community and authentic community? I want to put that word on it. Why is that so valuable when we talk about our mental health, having an authentic community? I'll go first. She's looking at me. <laughs> um, you know, um, I've loved this about East Church for a long time. Um, you know, we're pretty transparent here, you know, and, and sometimes I'm so transparent, I'm uncomfortable for people. I, I get that. But it's because y'all are very, very loving and, and very accepting. But, man, what I love about Thursday night, like I think one of the biggest uh, ministries of, of Celebrate Recovery is the acceptance people get. Yeah. So so this looks a lot like Thursday night. And what will happen is, you know, somebody will be up here doing the news, you know, and the, and the welcome. And they'll go, hey, listen, if you're a newcomer here tonight, man, we're so glad you're here. And look, we know how hard it was for you to make the decision. We know the pain, and, you know, I could go on and on. But you made it here tonight. And this happens every Thursday night without fail. The crowd just starts applauding. <laughs> the newcomer, yeah. and just accepts them. And you know what? I am moved every Thursday night. It's just this genuine thing because they've been there, whether whatever the issue, the alcohol, the anxiety, the depression, the bop, whatever, they've been there, mm -hmm. and they knew how hard it was. And all of a sudden, they come in, and they're accepted yeah. without taking the first step. And you know what? I, I, I love that over and over. And then, too, to have a place. Uh, and I've had an accountability partner for, golly, probably 30 years now. And he and I can confess sin, you know, to each other. And that is huge because I, uh, I don't think the church knows what to do with their sin. And what I mean by that is not before Christ. I'm talking about after Christ. And so I don't want to yeah. confess it. And I don't want to get up here and confess it, right? And we're all like, thank God we don't have to do that. But... If we don't have somebody to confess it to, we're just alone with it. And then shame. Can, but so community is essential. You know, I love Paul said in Romans, accept one another just as Christ Jesus accepted you. Sin, warts, everything. Yeah. So, yeah, community is vital. Yeah, it's vital. Absolutely. 
It's huge. And also being able to not only have conversations about the darkness, you know, a lot of churches that I'm in and people that I cross paths with, that's where they want to go. Let's just talk about the darkness. Let's talk about how hard it is. Let's talk about how we can get you through it. And they're talking. But what people really need is for someone to come alongside them and walk through the yep. darkness with them. Yep, 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 yep. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is when you sign up to do that, it is a long-term event usually, and it is messy. It is messy. And so being able to be the body of Christ and be able to walk through that with others is what Jesus has called us to do, and that's part of following him. Yep. Yeah. Man, that's so good. Um, well, I, this may be kind of what you just said really may be the answer to this question, Amy, but I, I did want to ask you what, from your perspective right now, what can the church do? And when I say the church, East Ridge, I mean, we're here at East Ridge for sure, but the church, us as Christian people, what can we do to meet this crisis head on? Because make no mistake, y'all, this, this is a mental health crisis that we're living in in the world that we live in right now. Scott shared that stat. That's diagnosable 50% of people. That's diagnosable, not to mention the not diagnosable or people that just don't ever go and ask for help. 50% of people um, are struggling with these things. So what can the church do? What, what's our first steps? Well, first of all, I want to applaud Eastridge and your staff for having this kind of staff that will allow a discussion like this to happen on a Sunday morning. When I told the other counselors at Eagles Landing what I was going to be doing this weekend, jaws were on the ground. They could not believe. They were like, we can't even do that in our own churches. <laughs> so being able to have that conversation and also just from what I'm hearing with Scott Moore being so transparent about his story and his journey, that's what we all need to do. Yeah. We all need to be transparent. Um, we got to take off the masks, guys. When you come to church, you got to leave that in the car. You cannot bring that mask in here that everything is okay and we're all good because you know what that does to the rest of us, right? We have to pretend then. And so being able to be authentic and to be who we are, it also looks like when you come into a church building that that is the priority here, right? Whether that's counseling offices, knowing who are your mental health professionals in your congregation. I don't go to a lot of congregations where there are mental health professionals. So that also requires a, a priority from your staff, that that is something that they want to help address in the church. That's training and education for um, the lay people and for the leadership within the congregation. And it's also coming from the top down, which you guys have already got a great example of that, but it's got to be a priority for everyone in the community and the church. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, and Scott, let me ask you this, man. Just let's get personal for a second with, with us here in the room. If there's somebody sitting out here that is right now, maybe somebody here is just going, I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm struggling with X, Y, or Z, and I don't know what step to take right now. What, what advice would you give to that person? Yeah, and it's not if. There, it is, is. There is someone here yeah. who's struggling. And so um, talk to someone. Talk to someone. It could be one, three of us. It could be your growth group leader. It could be your step study leader, your, your you know, at CR, your ministry team leader. Talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. You can email me at scott at eastridge.church. You know, um, I'm sure Kurt, I'm sure Amy will have information later. But talk to someone. And know this, you do not have to walk alone. You do not have to walk alone. So, yeah, let, let, one, of us, let one of us know. Let somebody know. Listen, that conversation, listen, when I had that conversation um, with Sammy, you know, my wife got her husband back. My kids got their father back. And, man, I, I have life, you know, all because I, I stepped out and had a conversation. Amen. Lastly, what, and this is for either of you guys, um, maybe there's, for some folks out here just going, I, I want to know how I can help. Like maybe you don't feel like you're struggling at the moment or you're doing okay and you, ha you have an opportunity to help or minister. How, I don't know. What could, what could somebody do there? What do you all think? Uh, Isaiah 58 tells us about the fast that God actually wants from us, and that is to feed the hungry and to help the poor and to provide homes for the homeless, but also to not turn away from your relatives that are in need. And um, as I prayed about this question, 
Uh, God kept bringing this scripture to mind. It's one that he's had over me for a long time, and it's Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, and it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, a festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. So with that... There are some of you, and you have a heart for this, whether you've been there or you're, you're just, you've never been there, but man, the Lord has put this on your heart. I'm, I'm building a team. Well, first of all, I'll talk about this. I'm building a team for Thursday nights uh, because I feel like we've got to do more than just say, I'm here if you need me. Mm-hmm. We've got to get into the ditch with people, mm-hmm. all right? And so I'm building a team on Thursday nights where we're just going to walk along aside people. I want to better equip sponsors that deal with mental health um, uh, participants. And also, too, I want to build champion, mental health champions. And so I talked to Kurt and Scott the other day. I want to do this, too, for, um, for Sunday mornings and, and your growth groups and stuff like this that, hey, let's train people. On, on how to help and how to love and how to serve. You know, Amy used this illustration the other day when we were meeting. Um, we want to we wanna hold on to the rope with you. Jesus got the rope, and you got the rope, and we want to grab the rope with you. And we want to walk with you as Jesus pulls you out of this ditch. Yeah. Go, so yeah. Come, come see me, you know, and I, I'd love to, you know, work with you and, and train you to, to better walk with, help, identify and, and walk with other people yeah man so much good wisdom and insight from you guys today i do want to encourage y'all um this this message is it's being filmed it'll be on our youtube's facebook like we post these things so share this with somebody who may need to hear it at some point or you yourself go back and listen to it i know i will um just to just to hear such good good thoughts and hopefully today again is just an opportunity for each one of us to know hey here's my next step and here's how i can move towards either healing or helping be an advocate for somebody and just us as a church shining a light into those dark places and going into it and go and let's walk together. So, hey, would y'all just thank them for being with us today? Thank you guys so much. Appreciate y'all. So, so, so good. Um, The band's going to come on back out here, and we are going to sing one more song. But this is is so cool, Amy, as you were reading that scripture from from, uh, Isaiah 61. I was thinking about... um, where Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, that she just read, where it ends up being applied in the New Testament. I don't know if y'all know this, but there was a man who read Isaiah 61 in a synagogue one day, and his name was Jesus, and he read it, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me, now this is Jesus, okay, and the Spirit has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Verse 20, then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. Now, when a teacher sat down like that in those days, it was like, now I'm going to tell you how this scripture is applied, right? I'm going to teach you something. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened to him. And he began to say to them this, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You know what Jesus is saying? about Isaiah 61, I came to do everything that was proclaimed would happen, to set the prisoners free, the captives free, to release them from oppression, to usher in the year of the Lord's favor. What is Jesus saying? I came here to bring healing to the world. Physically, yes, Jesus did that. But man, spiritually and mentally changing people, saving people, healing people. Again, that he came that we may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is proclaiming in this section the gospel. This is the gospel. Because I think sometimes we forget that the gospel is not just about you're now saved and forgiven of sin and you don't have to go to hell. It's not just about that. That is it. But it's also, man, I've come to redeem every part of you and all of you, and all of creation, and to usher in a new creation, right? And this is the hope we have in Christ Jesus. And I love that we talked about the fact that as the church, our job and our calling by God is to not just take our flashlight and shine it in the hole at people, but to step down into the hole 
take the flashlight with us and go, hey, grab my hand. Let's walk out together. You know who did that first? Jesus. Jesus could have from heaven said, hey, y'all are really messed up. Y'all should get some help for that. Or he could get dirty and he could get bloody like he did. That's what he did for us. I want us to be a church that will do that for each other and for others. And I think we are. So let's keep going. Okay, so listen, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna worship this Jesus right now. Again, just we're gonna sing one more song this morning. Um, I do wanna invite if uh, any prayer team, if you're here this morning, if you wanna stand and come up front, if you need prayer this morning, if maybe today your first step is just to go, hey, I need some help or I wanna talk to somebody or I need prayer for something, please come receive prayer this morning. We'd love to pray with you while we sing. Um, or if you just want to stay at your chair and pray right there where you're at, I really want, we're going to sing Run to the Father, but I want this to be a moment where we don't just sing it, we do it. Let's actually run to the Lord and trust him with all of these things, wherever we're at, okay? Let's pray together. God, we love you and thank you so much that uh, we can talk about all these hard things today, but really the beauty of just the truth that you bring to us, you show us in Jesus Christ. We're so grateful. Lord, let us run to you right now in worship and thanksgiving, maybe just in desperation if we have to, because we know in you and you alone are the answers, is all the healing, is the hope that we so desperately need. In Jesus' name, amen.